Cheers. Excellent. Look, thanks very much for that, uh, John, and thanks everybody for coming along um, this evening. Like Janet, I do a, a great number of talks around the, the country, not as many as, as yourself, almost 200 uh, last year. I probably made about um, 100 um, or so. And what I started finding, I guess, a couple of years ago was that more and more of the talks I was doing, in fact, were up in Auckland. I'd still travel every now and then to and Invercargill, New Plymouth, you know, Whanganui and these sort of places, but it got to the point of just over a year ago of a realisation that I pretty much have to be locating myself in Auckland for most of the time. So if you were to ask me me, where do I live? The formal uh, answer is my home is in Wellington, born and bred from Christchurch, hence no jacket. You see, I'm used to a warm, dry climate or just a cold climate there in the, in the, in, in the winter. Um, been in Wellington since after a couple of years in Sydney from the middle of 1987, but as of uh, last year, from about February um, or so, I've been locating myself up, up here in Auckland. Now, because you're, you're obviously interested in the property market, let me give you my little property story which some of you may know about already if you bought the listener from about three weeks ago, the February 29 um, issue, where they talked about a thing I purchased in September or so last year. The thing I bought before that was just a simple 27 square metre um, apartment, little shoebox thing in uh, Eden Crescent there, so simple walk to work, and that was great fun uh, having that to stay in because there was no budget uh, for me to be in a hotel um, every night, and uh, I don't know if you've been on the road like myself, you do get sick of of different hotels all the time, and when I in fact started coming up to Auckland quite frequently, the hotels were full, um, either Chinese New Year thing or the Cricket World Cup going on, so spent quite a number of nights in youth hostels around the city as well. They're not so bad. Uh, I go tramping now and then, so I'm used to tramping huts, so that was sort of my basis of comparison. And the same thing for the wee apartment there as, as, as well. I thought to myself, this is just like a big you know, tramping hut. Um, I had a lot of fun with it. I'm a wee bit of a handyman, so the first thing I did was put a saw through the wooden double bed and convert it into a single bed, swap the mattresses with a hotel in the place, and then dismantled the cupboard, a big wardrobe, and made a wall and TV on one side, bed on the other, and it was all great fun for a while. But then I got myself to about the middle, of last year, about July or so. And a number of thoughts sort of started running through my, my head there, a number of things starting to apply a little bit of pressure. Number one was I was building up a bank balance sum again and thinking to myself, I am not going to be achieving my 6% term deposit rate that I've been saying to other people is eventually going to come along again. And I thought, I'm not going to achieve that for a while. In fact, I'm probably never going to ever again see 6% term deposit rates in New Zealand. So I'm getting a bit sick of this money building up and not really earning all that much in the back in the bank, so maybe I need to find something else to do with it. And so I started going online, looking at uh, bits of land out Nelson, Fokatane, um, this sort of thing. But I kept thinking to myself, why I'm sure, while I'm sure these would be good investments, doesn't really offer me something to do in the evening. I was looking for something that maybe in the evenings I could keep myself busy, you know, um, occupied, rather than just walking around town and in the minds of my poor mind of my poor wife doing God knows what gallivanting around uh, New Zealand's biggest uh, uh, city. So I started looking at uh, apartments online there in Auckland. But of course, you, you will have all done this uh, far more, I'm sure, than, than I uh, did at the time. You're looking at 60 square metre apartment for $600,000 or 80 square metre for you know $800,000. And yeah, definitely bigger than my 27 square metre, so good, but also A, expensive, and B, finished. What could I do in the evening with these sort of apartments there, redecorate them or this sort of thing? And as I was sort of looking through there, I kept coming across this one advertisement, which was on Trade Me, and it was for a disused cocktail bar. And I thought, surely not. Surely, you know, you can't feasibly go and buy that. But basically, I fell in love with this place. And especially after I went and viewed it for the first time, and I guess it was uh, August or late July, in fact, uh, last year. And I thought to myself, well, can you live in this disused cocktail bar? And, of course, it was zoned commercial. So I went along to the council. I had a pre-application meeting with a view towards getting a resource consent change from commercial to residential. And they said, oh, yeah, there's not much light coming into it, but you could probably get one bedroom in it. So they didn't say, yes, you'll get the consent. They can't do that. But they indicated, yep, maybe you could get one bedroom. And, of course, for me, that's all I want, if any bedroom at all. I have five children down in Wellington there and one wife. And uh, I've got, you know, the 21-year-old, 18-year-old. I sort of don't want them 
moving up with me in Auckland during the week and essentially claiming the place for their own. So I thought, one bedroom, absolutely perfect. And so I, I get the planning consultants in, they draw the whole thing up, uh, but basically go and buy the place, okay? And uh, eventually, of course, the... Uh, Having bought it, the consent comes through, only takes uh, about four weeks, and so now it's been rezoned from commercial to residential. So what I've got is basically a 168 square metre apartment with a 10 square metre balcony. They're no great view um, or anything uh, at all, and I have great fun each evening sort of redecorating, not so much redeveloping the whole thing, but redecorating it, cutting a bit of the bench apart to put an oven in, putting a range hood in and this sort of thing, turning one of the three toilet cubicles into a shower in the middle, and the way to do that is that to avoid getting a building consent for anything. Of course, you get, need to get your aluminium tray made up and put the walls in, and it was all great fun sort of uh, uh, doing that. So that's what I've been busy doing. And I'm not generally, I guess, a property investor. It's not what I do, but it sort of turned out okay. The first apartment I still hold, why buy something in Auckland and sell it, I guess is the message I've been giving for a number of years now. So that's rented out to the hotel, which uh, occupy this building there. And this place I intend keeping for absolute eons because I can't see anything other than Auckland house prices continuing to rise at unpredictable pace over the next few years. And what I've been inviting people to do, especially over the past two years, when they say Auckland is unaffordable, young people can't buy a house, uh, when is the shortage going to be uh, corrected? And my response has been, probably that shortage will be corrected at the same time as the shortage in London disappears as well. Because, of course, you know, although there's a slight difference between Auckland and, and, and London, and I don't say that so much in the rest of the country, you know, because they hate you, basically, in the rest of the, rest of the country. <laughs> Essentially, that's what it is, and that's one of the things I'm going gonna, gonna to talk about up, up there. So if you're interested in that, maybe you can still find the listener from, like I say, about three weeks ago, and I've got a picture of me sitting at the, at the bar there and this interesting terminology. At the end of a day, hard work in Auckland, Tony goes to a bar, you know, as if I drink every night, which is, is not the case at all. Now... I do a lot of talks around the country, and generally what I do is this. I'll start noting wobbliness internationally since the start of this year. Here's why things have been wobbly since the start of this year. And then I'll talk about monetary policy overseas and worries about deflation, etc. And then I'll switch across to the New Zealand economy, dairying weakness, but here's all the other stuff going on. And out of all that, we get an economy still growing pretty well over the near future, and that usually takes up about 40 minutes or so. That's not uh, what I'm going to do um, this evening. Instead, what I did yesterday was give it some thought, and I jotted down nine key points that I want to speak about of relevance to the Auckland residential property market in particular. So basically, go for the jugular straight away. So if you're looking for the full, cohesive, coherent macroeconomic analysis of the New Zealand economy, that's not what I'm going to give. You need to come along to one of the other talks that I give you know, around the place, etc. Or just go to my website, tonyalexander.co.au, NZ and a publication I've got there, the weekly overview, comes out Thursday night or Wednesday night um, pre-Easter, and that's when I generally talk about the economy overall. And for instance, last week I, I rabbited on for about two and a half pages about the dairy sector and some of the problems there, and also the change in the Reserve Bank's interest rate and why not all banks passed on the 0.25% uh, decrease in the cash rate. So maybe we can get to that later on. If you've got any questions, um, I intend holding a bit of a Q&A session um, towards the end there, so I anticipate being off this stage by just after um, 8 o'clock, and then Matthew's going to have his session, and then uh, I think we're both getting back on the stage again, so there'll be another wee opportunity for Q&A uh, for, for a second time there uh, after he has done his session. So, let's get stuck into it. Factors relevant to what's going to be happening in the Auckland market, sort of in the context of if one of these factors was going in completely the opposite direction from what I'm going to talk about, oh, it would make one a wee bit wary about what's going to happen in the housing market in the near future. That's the sort of approach I'm taking here. So, number one would simply be um, growth in the economy. If I was to analyse things happening out there like weakness in the dairy sector and say, as a result of that and a few other things, New Zealand is going to be munted, which for those of you not from sort of Dunedin, uh, South Island, means stuffed, okay? As a student at Otago University, you would get thoroughly munted on a Friday night, Saturday night, probably Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, um, et, et, et cetera. Um, is the New Zealand economy going to be munted? And the answer most definitely is not. And even as the Reserve Bank cut interest rates two weeks ago, they were forecasting the economy would grow 3.1% this coming year and the year after. 
We definitely have the weakness in the dairy sector, so the incomes for the dairy farmers obviously fallen away tremendously. But also, we need to be aware that it's not just the dairy farmers where the pain hits. Frankly, greater pain will be felt by the many tens of thousands of companies which service the dairying sector. They're selling them the tractors, the fertiliser, they're fixing up the equipment, the machinery, maintenance, all that sort of stuff. When farmers hit to hard times, they stop spending, just absolutely cease it. And so the anticipation of revenue that all these other people have um, had, it's completely gone out the window. So yes, there will definitely be weakness in the parts of the New Zealand economy, highly dependent upon the uh, dairying sector in particular. So obviously your Taranaki, um, uh, uh, Waikato, uh, Southland as well, uh, South Canterbury and other parts of the country where dairying is significant. So that's a big negative that sits out there. But we've got all these other very strongly growing parts of the New Zealand economy, and I won't go into as much detail here as I would normally do so, but number one would be tourism. The tourism sector in New Zealand is going absolutely gangbusters. In the past year, the number of people visiting New Zealand has increased about 11%. The spending by people visiting New Zealand has gone up by about 30% or um, so. There's a few numbers out there, but let's just use 30%. Big surge in New Zealand's tourism sector. And what that means is that even for the Waikato, where there's the dairying weakness, they have their own tourism boom. When I drove down to Matamata of about uh, four weeks ago, just off to the side of, uh, of Hamilton, I saw a carload of Chinese tourists pulled up to the side of the road, and there's an important thing, not the bus, but a carload of Chinese uh, uh, tourists. They're moving into what we call being fit travellers, free independent travellers, so not just going on the, on the coach tours. And they had their cameras out taking pictures of pretty black and white cows. I don't know what it is about the black and white cows that are so fascinating, but there's a massive business opportunity we should embrace this time around that we never did when the Japanese tourists were flooding in here many years ago. And what the Japanese did was, uh, for some reason, they found a great affinity with sheep. They seem to absolutely love sheep. We should have sold each Japanese visitor a sheep and looked after the sheep for many years, uh, uh, share it and send them the wool for 50 bucks or so um, every, uh, every, every year. And then when the beastie died, maybe we could send them the meat. You wouldn't want to eat it, but maybe we could send it to them. And we could send them the pelt or something for $100 or, or something like that. We've got to find out, uh, do Chinese like black and white cows and can we give them names and start renting them out to them or, or something like that. There are massive business opportunities spread all throughout the country as this massively, rapidly growing number of Chinese visitors in particular, they spread their wings just off that main route, Auckland, uh, uh, Waitomo, and maybe down to Queenstown, etc. So tourism sector going gangbusters. Secondly, the education sector, so foreign students coming to study in New Zealand, maybe it's English language or maybe it's state school, university, uh, education institute uh, uh, level, a big increase in numbers over the past uh, one and a half years, and in particular, numbers coming from India. There was a visa change of about 18 or 24 months ago, so now the students can come in and do some part-time work as well, and for whatever reason, it's led to a, quite a surge in the number of Indian students. So if you haven't been into Queen Street for a while, and the last time you visited was two or three years ago, when maybe you walked along and you felt like you were in Hong Kong or something like that because of the, the dominance of the Chinese students, now you're going to feel like you're in Mumbai or something like that. Indian students, uh, colourful turbans, etc., all over, over the place. Big masses of people going that way for some reason and then coming back the other, other, other way. Huge sector for the New Zealand economy, bringing in about $3 billion. So tourism, when you strip out the education thing, because the tourism people sort of leave in the education thing, T tourism maybe brings in $10 billion or so to the economy. Education of foreign students may be about $3 billion and rising rapidly. And 60% of the foreign students, this is important, coming to New Zealand, come to Auckland, somewhere on or just off Queen Street as, uh, as well. So no, it's a market which you'd, you'd then think, OK, as long as the increased student numbers keep coming, that's great for rental properties in the CBD. But just be aware this can be a volatile sector. And if you get something which makes the parents back in India or China fearful of their uh, children's experience in New Zealand, then they will disappear, which is what happened in the early 2000s from 03 or 04. So it's not a guaranteed sector. That's one of the risks that's uh, attached to it. Other exports also doing well. Forestry is okay. Sheep and beef is okay. Pip fruit, so that's your apples and pears, rising very strongly. Uh, wine industry also doing very well. About one point five billion dollars worth of wine exports are, are from New Zealand. Kiwi fruit going gangbusters. Manufacturing is also doing very well, interestingly enough. And my personal favourite at the moment, honey. 
Now, honey exports from New Zealand are worth about $300 million, and what I like to do is say to people that that's where the wine industry was in 2002. Use the same dollars, and that's where wine was you know, 13, 14 years ago. And this sector is growing very strongly, mainly with the Manuka honey exports and all the nice you know, health benefits that come from that. Manuka honey exports, I think, are about $240 million or so. And what it's leading to in the farming sector is that it's, there's an undoing of stuff that's happened for the past 200 years. We've spent 200 years or so of getting rid of the manuka on the hillsides. You burn it, you get two bulldozers, you put a big steel cable between them, and you just scrape a whole hillside bare of all the manuka. Well, now, one of the fastest growing sectors in New Zealand is nurseries. Remember, they made all the little pine seedlings you know, back in the early 1990s? Well, now they're growing manuka as fast as possible because farmers are planting out their hillsides in manuka, which will grow, flower, and then the bees will go and gather the, the pollen, etc., for the manuka honey. How you constrain the feeding of those bees to your bees and not some other person's bees, I don't know, but there's got to be some technological solution where you can inject some sort of dye into your hives and then when your bees come out, they're maybe a slightly different colour and then the drone technology in five years will be so good that the drones will have little laser beams on them and they will simply hover above all the manuka there and shoot all the bees that don't have that particular uh, colour um, on the... It's, it's going to come along. Um, there's probably a little company setting up in Wire Rapid to develop the technology called Skynet or Cyberdyne Simpsons, um, something like that. Let's also whack in um, construction. So infrastructure, obviously, in Auckland, there's a multi-decade period of catch-up infrastructure um, construction to be done, so lots of people are working there. In Christchurch, house building is now falling away, down about 25% on a year ago. In Christchurch, the number of consents for houses to be built, but it's still a high level, about 80% above average level of house building in Christchurch. So it is still very, very strong, but it's now declining about 25% per annum. In Auckland, the number of consents being issued, running about 25% ahead of a year earlier, so house building is picking up um, in Auckland, and outside of Christchurch and Auckland, in the rest of the country, the number of consents being issued for new houses to be built running 39% ahead of a year earlier. That has implications for Auckland and the availability of builders that I'm going to come, back, come to later on. I could run through some other things here, but the upshot of it all is that we have some very strong factors offsetting the weakness in the dairy sector. Consumer confidence is above average, we've seen in a couple of recent numbers. Retail spending growing very strongly, so that's quite important as an economic driver. And so that leads the majority of us, excuse me, to be forecasting our economy grows 25 to 3% this year, next year, maybe the year after. I mean, that three years out is pretty much anybody's guess, OK? But basically, we have some good support for the economy. And so can I look at the economy and say, it's going to be munted, and therefore Auckland, of course, is a third of the economy will be munted? No, not at all. It's a supporting factor for housing market, willingness of people to invest, etc. That's point number one. Point number two is more specifically about Auckland, and this is what I wrote a lot about just over a year ago and formed the basis of most of my talks, and it was about the developing role of Auckland as more than just a collection of many Invercargles and Whanganui's. Physically, the place may look like that, like 40 Invercargles were just plonked down in the, in the place there because there really isn't all that much high-rise uh, construction around uh, the place, but... Auckland is able to deliver to New Zealand something no other major city can. Yeah, bits of it in Hamilton and Christchurch and Wellington, but basically Auckland is New Zealand's only serious chance of what we call an agglomeration. London, San Francisco sort of thing. Basically, where you have a lot of very talented, free-thinking people from diverse uh, backgrounds interacting, exchanging ideas, developing new technologies, implementing the new technologies, and this is generally where more and more economic growth around the planet is coming from. It's not coming from you're growing your farming sector. It's not coming from you growing your manufacturing sector. It's coming more and more from a lot of people, a neural network, as it were, of people physically exchanging uh, 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 ideas with each other, developing businesses, putting them into place, closing them quickly if they don't fail. That whole entrepreneurship sort of thing functions very, very well with an agglomeration of people all in one place. That's where economic theory is in terms of what's a key driving force for growth in economies around the planet now. And Auckland is New Zealand's only serious chance to do that, and that's why 
why the government, Auckland City Council obviously, are very interested in developing the infrastructure as quickly as possible in Auckland. Because in order to retain those talented free thinking people and to attract them from overseas for you know, periods of time, you need to have a city that works very well, especially when it comes down to the transport um, infrastructure. And so that in itself is what I was talking about about a year ago, that if we were going to get rich on the back of the dairy sector, well, we would already be there by now. New Zealand's economic growth is going to come more and more basically from Auckland itself. And I can't quite remember these numbers now, but a year ago I was talking along the lines of, for the next 30 years, about 90% or so growth in the workforce, the working age population in New Zealand, is going to occur in Auckland. Companies will by and large have no choice other than to locate premises in Auckland to find the staff that they want. And I remember looking at the demographic projections at the time, noting that in some parts of the country, the population, the working age population, was already shrinking, making it difficult for businesses to maybe be located in places like Northland and in, in, in your Wanganui, these sort of places as well. And it's interesting to note that even with the development of technology that allows us to you know, stay at home and sit in your underpants all day and, and telecommute, well, we don't. You get sick of it. You, know, you get a bit cold, obviously, after a period of time. Um, but we basically function better when we interact with other people physically, not that physical, but basically being close um, to, other, to other people. We are social animals, essentially. So virtual presence sort of technology, it's like all this sort of stuff. Actually, technology is bringing us to live closer together and work closer together and not all of us to be re located in you know, Riverton, Whanganui, Kaitaia um, or something like that. So that's something special which Auckland has got. And just in case I forget to mention this late, later on, with the development of Auckland, you also got to th think in terms of what nodes around the country will get carried along by Auckland's development. And obviously Hamilton is right in there. Companies will be able to locate some staff in Hamilton. People will be able to live in Hamilton and increasingly as the transport network improves, commute to Auckland. So when you stand right back and take a 100 year view, where then is the economic development of New Zealand going to occur? I mean, obviously you're looking at that whole corridor from your Auckland down towards Hamilton. It may not happen a lot of it in 5, 10, you know, 15 years, but over the long term, that's where New Zealand's economic development is, go, is so much of it's going to be located. And I talked a little bit about this last year in the context of so many Asian migrants coming into New Zealand, coming from an eco economies where they have seen people moving from rural backgrounds and living into urban settings. And they have seen these massive population shifts and know what it means for if you buy some land, first of all, what it means in terms of your capital gain, in terms of your wealth. And so when we've seen so many Asians coming in and buying property in Auckland, possibly a lot of that has simply been because they know what is going to happen here, that with the strong population growth, Auckland is going to be able to produce sort of strong economic growth, capital gains, more than many other parts of New Zealand. That's the economic model they're used to. That's what they've been seeing in the likes of Indonesia, you know, China and other parts of Asia um, in particular. So they've got sort of an awareness of that economic development model, which in New Zealand we're not so much used to. Still, the bulk of people out there think, outside Auckland, that Auckland is just 40 Invercargles or something like that. They haven't yet cottoned on to the fact that whereas in 1961, Auckland accounted for 21% of New Zealand's population, in the census of 2013, it accounted for 34% and it's projected to be uh, about 40% plus by 2043. So very different dynamic, and of course, you know, becoming like London and all that sort of thing. But without enough people to develop a tube system. I wrote a wee paper on, uh, on, on a number of things just the other day, and people had had discussions, and somebody suggested high-speed rail. We should have high-speed rail, Auckland, Hamilton, and we should have Auckland in the middle there, high-speed rail, Whangarei, Tauranga, Hamilton. I wonder how much that would cost. Well, I sort of worked out a rough number. The, with Auckland as a hub there, you're talking 500 kilometres of high-speed rail network. Across in Australia, there's a proposal to build high-speed train, you know, 250k per hour travel, from Brisbane to Sydney down to Melbourne, so over about 1,700 kilometres, just a bit more than that, at a total cost of 114 
billion Aussie dollars, 65 million Aussie dollars per kilometre, applied to, let's say, 500 kilometres in New Zealand to make some bold assumptions about labour costs, etc. So it would cost maybe $33 billion to build a high-speed rail network around Auckland with itself um, as the hub there. Not very feasible at all. And don't even think about maglev technology of going sort of 600 kilometres an hour. I did work out what the number would be there based on the Japanese example. Um, it was completely through the roof. It was just so absurd, it's no point. Even, even myself trying to remember it. No, there will not be high-speed rail in, in New Zealand, even without talking about geological instability. But that's the second factor. Auckland is different from the rest of the country. But with nodes of agglomeration, linkages, and this is what I emphasise around the rest of the country, in Hamilton, uh, Wellington, and Christchurch in particular. Outside of that, not so much. Third factor, the biggie, migration. Post-GFC... As a result of you know, the shock of people seeing debt pro proving itself to be relatively dangerous there, uh, shocks on interest rates and all these sort of things, the way we as economic agents, as individuals, act economically has changed meaning that the economic models we all developed based on experience, people doing things from the 1980s through to 2007, none of the economic models work any longer. Whether it's the IMF, OECD, Reserve Bank of New Zealand, Australia, Bank of England or whatever, our big mathematical models, they no longer work. They are not generating accurate forecasts of just about anything these days, obviously on interest rates. And what I want to do is just give you one factor leading to why the interest rate forecasts, for instance, uh, have invariably been too high. You see, normally you'd get a certain level of economic growth, which would lead to a certain level of jobs growth, which would lead to a feeling of job security on the part of the employees, which would lead them to demand a certain level of wages growth, which they would probably be given. And with the wages going up, that would lead to increased consumer spending, but it would also lead to businesses going, oh, our costs have gone up, so we'll whack our prices up. So economic growth, jobs growth, wages growth, inflation increase, interest rates going up. That doesn't happen these days. You get your economic growth, that's fine. You get your jobs growth, that's fine. Not getting the wages growth, which you would have got pre-GFC around the world. And my answer to why is it that people, when, even when they've got high job security, uh, they're not asking for the big wage increases? It's because every day we're reading worrying stories overseas about Greece or the Middle East, or it's about Spain, or it's the Chinese economy. And if you're going to walk up to the boss and say, give me another 10% or I'm out of here, you're not willing to have your bluff called of she says, okay, you're out of here. Oh, problem. Because then you go to another firm, maybe you get your 10%, but you're last on. You'll be first off if something hits the fan overseas, and we're not willing to have our bluff called. So around the world, even where labour markets are strong, it's not leading to the wages growth in the past. Therefore, not the inflation. Therefore, our interest rate forecasts have been too high. And then it gets more complicated than, than that. Let's say it still worked. Let's say you still had economic growth, jobs growth, wages growth, can companies put up prices? Can retailers put up prices as they would have previously? No, they cannot. If you go back 10, 20, 30 years, say you want to buy a table, you see it in the newspaper, advertised are there, and a lovely black and white ad in the paper there, uh, for $500, you go along to the shop on uh, late night shopping on a Friday night or so, and uh, there's the table sitting there you want to buy, but it's $550. What are you going to do? How are you going to find an alternative to that table? There's no internet or anything. There's no ability to easily search for an alternative. You will have to spend the remaining one and a half hour late night shopping, driving around other parts of the city, trying to find a car park to go to, you know, the version back then of uh, Colder Mackay's or Farmers or Hayes or something down in Christchurch. Or maybe you wait to Monday and you go look through the yellow pages. For those of you who don't know what the yellow pages were, it's a list of all businesses there. They're their phone numbers, this sort of, this sort of thing. I, I, I feel obliged to throw that, uh, throw that in. The cost of searching for an alternative to something we wanted to buy in the past was very, very high. These days, the cost of us searching an alternative product and price to the $500 table I want is almost zero. I'm just straight on the cell phone, basically, and look, here's what Harvey Norman is selling it for. Bunnings have even got the same table over there or something similar, and they're at $420, and we'll just show it to the salesperson. What are you going to do for me? The ability of retailers to get away with jacking prices up has gone out the window. One reason why 
retailing around the world, even in countries like New Zealand where spending is rising quite rapidly, we're, we're spending quite a bit, retailers are still falling over because they're not able to get the margins that they were in the past. And where their costs go up, it's hard for them to pass on the price increases because of technology changes. So that constrains inflation. Anyway, the upshot of all, all that is that if the economic models don't work, you're thinking, why the hell am I sitting here listening to this bloke? Okay, well partly A, because I've been right on the housing market in Auckland since 2008, but the other reason is, if you can't so much use the economic models, you go back to the very basics, and the most basic economic driver out there is population change, the basic demographics. And for Auckland, I've sort of already hinted at it, we're seeing the population last year grow by about 3%, the rest of the country's population grew by about 1.4%. And one of the key drivers here is not just that Auckland has the youngest population of all regional councils in New Zealand, it's of course 60% of the net migration gain for New Zealand accrues to Auckland. That is not saying 60% of the people who came in last year, 124,000 of them, that they all went to Auckland. Because the net migration gain in the past year of 67,400, that reflects about 124,000 people coming in and whatever it is, 57,000 people leaving. Okay, so you've got these two gross flows. Out of the net difference, 67,000, Auckland got 60% of that gain last year. And so Auckland is achieving this high you know, population growth. Now, um, in my weekly overview for tomorrow night, if you're interested in the migration numbers, uh, I don't know if I'll have time here, but you can see why it's just not feasible to, say, uh, change migration policy to radically uh, uh, cap the numbers. Maybe I'll come back to that uh, uh, later on. Um, the upshot of that is, OK, if the migration numbers are high now, three years ago, it was only a gain of about 1,000 people. So over the three-year period, we've got a net gain of 1,000 going to a net gain 67,400, it's about a 1.4 population boost for the economy overall. And it's a no-brainer what that does for demand for retail goods and services, domestic travel around the place, and obviously accommodation as well. Okay, so in line of uh, what I said earlier on, I've got these factors and I'm asking myself, is one of these going to get absolutely munted and stuff up your housing market? Aspirations in the near future. And so for the migration numbers to be munted, to go into maybe a big negative, you need pretty much two things happening at the same time. You need, number one, the New Zealand economy going into recession or something very much like it. No, we're looking at 25 to 3% growth, all these big good factors out there. And you need a boom in the Australian commodity sector so that you and I, we're earning whatever in New Zealand, and then we hear of a cousy across there who's making 150,000 Australian dollars shooing roos off the track out at WA or something like that. Or they're driving some huge piece of machinery you know, down in some pit over in Australia, and we think, well, I can give that a go. And what goes through people's minds is, I will go to Australia, I will work in the dust and the sand there for three years, I will build up a nest egg, and then I will come back. This happens about once a generation or so. It has happened for this generation. Australia's development of its mineral sector is closely tied into China's economic growth, especially the surge from 2009, and that surge being concentrated on infrastructure development, you know, needing all the steel and iron ore and coal, etc., all of that in China. Now that is easing off. And so Australia has had its commodity boom, it's not coming along again for maybe another generation, it will come along again, it just does, but not in the next few years. And so that doubling of the factors, the weak New Zealand economy, maybe recession, and Australia just being a complete no-brainer that you should go there, I don't see that coming along in the near future. These migration numbers, they're probably going to peak around 71,000 net gain, I mean it's just absolutely huge. And then I'll think they'll, I think they'll come off, but not at a very rapid pace. You're looking at continued strong population injection to New Zealand with 60% of that net gain accruing to Auckland. So duh, in terms of you know, the basic demographics of the situation, and you know, in your own head you can sort of figure out what that means you know, for, the, for the housing market. Now, related to that, construction. So I'm on to my fourth point here. You know, construction in terms of... Is it possible that construction will absolutely hugely boom in Auckland? Because after all, it did in Canterbury. They had an earthquake. On average in Canterbury, they would build 3,500 houses a year or so. That's the number of consents that would get issued. And yet in a very short period of time after the earthquake, they got themselves to 7,200 consents issued for houses to be built in Canterbury in the year to about 15 or 16 months ago. 
with the land available and all stops pulled out, yes, you can build a lot of houses in a hurry. So can that happen in Auckland? Is that going to happen in Auckland? Well, the answer is no, that is not going to happen in Auckland. Although construction is now rising, there are so many constraints on the ability of house supply to rise strongly, which I suppose everybody knows about in, 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 in some regard, some of you in far more detail than, than I ever will. First of all, uh, it's probably going to be a shortage of builders. So you want to get something done. I'm trying to do everything I can except electrical stuff in my little apartment slash bar situation there. So I won't touch electrical. Having been electrocuted once up a uh, tree, cutting the, a branch and it falls on the line and 11,000, what is it, whatever it is, volts go through you, um, you scream like a girl. <laughs> There's nothing manly about it. If you've ever seen the Home Alone 2 movie where one of the baddies grabs the taps there and the kid has got the generator or something tied up and he's screaming his head off this high pitch and the skeleton shows up, that's what it's like when you get electrocuted up a tree with the, the power going through you. And I used to tell this story for a number of years along the lines of I cut the branch, it fell on the line um, and after a few seconds I was able to let the saw go. Well, the only reason I was able to let the saw go and not die up the tree was because back in the substation, it detected, oh, oh, big drain in power. Something bad is happening to somebody. We'll cut off the power for a while. So that's why the muscles were able to relax and, and I was able to release the saw. And then my story would continue, but then I could feel the tree and you can feel it tingling, you know, and the, there's red hot glow on the branch, etc., over there, and it's January and there's dry grass everywhere. So I'm thinking, okay, this tree is still alive and I'm going to go up like a, like a tree on fire pretty soon as well. So I jump out of the tree and basically conduct again on the way down, and scream like a girl again on the way down, luckily hit the ground and rolled without straddling a, a bottom branch. Okay, just, just think about it. And, and then somebody told me about five years ago, because this happened about 20 years back, it's a good idea that you did jump out of the tree, because what happens is the substation will cut the power off, and then it will go, oh, put it back on, Oh, there's still a power drain there. We, a branch has fallen on the line. We need to flick the branch off the line and it will send through the mother of all whatevers down the line <laughs> to try and flick the bloody branch off. So not knowing this, I, I jumped out and, and so there we go. So I, I don't do electrical around the property. Anything else, I'll have a go at essentially uh, uh, myself. But there's a shortage of builders out there, of electricians, of plasterers. And you've got, of course, every man and his dog that decides, I, I, I know righty-tighty, lefty-loosey on a screwdriver. I'm going to go on builderscrack.co.nz and I'm going to set myself up there as some sort of tradesperson. I mean, why, why not? Either do it here or do it on the Gold Coast. Get a few tattoos on you and go to the Gold Coast. There's a construction boom happening um, over there, uh, which I'll come back to later on. In Auckland, on average over the past 23 years, the number of consents issued for new dwellings to be built has been about 7,500 per annum. So that's Auckland's average. The average which has given us this sure, huge shortage at the moment. There are all different estimates of the shortage, and I, I, I think trying to put a number on it is pretty much useless, because in economics terms, a shortage only exists if the price doesn't adjust. Technically, prices going up are alleviating the shortage because it's weeding out uh, buyers and bringing forward some extra supply. Okay, so technically, in economic terms, shortages don't really um, exist. But Auckland has been underbuilding since maybe 2004, 2005. That's why in late 08, when others are saying, GFC, it's all going bad overseas, Lehman's, etc., prices of houses will fall 40% in New Zealand. I said, no, they won't will fall maybe 10 to 15%, but that's going to be it, because we did not go into the global financial crisis with excess production of houses in New Zealand. Consent numbers were falling away from a decent peak in about 2003 or so. Now, in the most recent years, year, the number of consents issued in Auckland is 9,300. So it's increased quite well from four years ago when it was at its lowest level since the 1960s, meaning Auckland went into the GFC with a shortage. The shortage got phenomenally worse as construction absolutely plummeted to worse than I'd ever seen before, back to 1960s levels come 2011, 12. Now it's been increasing, but it's only just above average. It's increased about 25% in the past year. Okay, now I'm gonna run through a little exercise uh, uh, on my, the population growth. So, Auckland's population last year grew about 3%, so roughly 45,000 extra people last year to be housed in Auckland. 
Average household occupancy in Auckland is three people per house. The rest of the country is about two and a half people per house. So to house an extra 45,000 people, you need an extra 15,000 houses to have been built the past 12 months to stop the shortage getting even worse. But only, I'm a bit fudging the, the months here, but only 9,300 consents were issued. So you're thinking, oh, the shortage got worse by 6,000. No, 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 it's even worse than that. Because only about 80 sometimes 90% of the consents issued add to the housing stock. Sometimes you issue a consent for a new house to be built and it's just replacing one that was burnt down somewhere on Waiheke Island. Or it's replacing you know, maybe the Navy houses on Devonport Point, you know, 74 of them disappear to put in place 300 houses or something like that. So if you divide 15,000 sort of extra houses required by 0.8, how many consents needed to be issued last year to stop the shortage getting worse? 19,000 and Auckland probably will never approach that over the next 10 or 20 years. The upshot of that is that whether you're talking about shortage of builders, resource consent processing times, shortage of land or what, whatever, it all adds up to not enough places are built, it's very unlikely enough places will be built in the next few years, the shortage is bad, it's getting worse, it's going to continue to get worse over the next few years. Economics 101, the price implication is pretty clear as a result of that. And there's another little relevance here, I think I'm going to put it in here. I mentioned earlier on, Canterbury consents down 25% last year, this past year. Auckland up 25%, the rest of the country up 39%. Now why did I say that? You're a builder, you're an electrician, you're going to make pretty much as much money building a house down in Riverton, Kaitai, Rekitahuna or whatever, doing it there as doing it in Auckland, and yet your living expenses, travelling times are going to be a heck of a lot less. Your time available to be with your kids, be with your spouse, a heck of a lot more. And that's very important. And one of the phenomena of one, two cycles ago, there were tradespeople who were absolutely run off their feet in Auckland building stuff. They were cutting their days of work from five down to four days. So they could go out fishing and basically partake of a good lifestyle. So my theory is that as this house building now rises in the rest of the country, some of the tradespeople you've got working for you at the moment, like one of my electricians, they're going to shift out to the countryside and do as much work out there, but have a heck of a better lifestyle and net probably make more income as well. So shortage of builders just aggravates the ability to increase the, um, the construction. That's, okay, another factor there. What about interest rates? Do I have in my head a view that it's likely interest rates will rise strongly very short, shortly, everyone will get frightened, the mortgage rates back at 11% that we saw in you know, 2008 and 1998, and therefore the housing market has a decent old decline? Do I think that? No, I do not. The key message I've been getting across increasingly the past two years has been the period from the 1970s to 2007, that was an aberration of high inflation. We're back in the 1600s, 1700s, 1800s, where prices hardly ever change. Inflation is a, is a term that people will forget about. Some people will worry about deflation. That's what used to worry people in the, in, the, in the old days there. Interest rates won't be going back to the high levels in the past. And the key problem for central banks um, at the moment is trying to generate inflation in their economies. They can't do it. Cutting interest rates can't do it any longer. Even printing money is not doing it in Europe or across in Japan um, in particular. The outlook is for low interest rates for decades, not just another 18 months or three years or something like that. We are looking at this over a very long extended period of time. Now, in New Zealand, we are used to our thinking about interest rates and analysing the impact of interest rate changes from a borrower's perspective. And people like myself and many of yourselves here who would have borrowed at 18.5% or more, my first house back in 1987, I think, oh my God, what would I have bought at 4.5% interest rate in 1987? I wouldn't have been buying in this hole in the ground, four hours sun and winter situation, Curtis Street down in Wellington there. I would have been up Candala or something like that. Well, of course, so would everybody else with better ability uh, to borrow money. And one of the key things that's been happening in Auckland, Auckland has led the country in house prices adjusting to a different inflation, to a different interest rate outlook. And so when you look at the debt servicing, banks are still you know, trying to keep the debt servicing below 30 or 33% of you know, disposable income for a household. It's the same ratio pretty much as it was back in 1987, 1997, etc. But now, of course, you've got uh, the interest rates are so much lower, people can borrow a heck of a lot more. And the first ones who do that borrowing, they push the prices up. 
and a few years go by and you end up with exactly the same debt service and costs now with an interest rate of 4.5% as when I bought a house at 18.5% and some others were paying 22% back at that time of late 1987, 88 um, as well. The outlook is for interest rates being low over a long period of time. And why that becomes relevant is, I think, more and more from the investor point of view. Because the most frequent question I get now is not what it was a few years ago, where's the Kiwi dollar going against the Aussie dollar, and then it became, where's the Kiwi dollar going against the pound, and it's not, you know, what's the outlook for, 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 for interest rates or this sort of thing. It's, where do I get yield? Interest rates are so low, the bank's hardly paying anything at all. Where do I invest my money to get a decent return? And the question is now so frequent in my weekly overview, in my section there, if I were a borrower, what would I do? I've got a little section there, if I were a saver, but I don't tell you. I invite you to click on a link, and the link will take you to one of my web pages which says, I am not going to tell you, legally I can't tell you where to invest your money, and as borrowers, we're all pretty much the same by and large, but as investors, we are all unique individuals. We've got different views on how long we're going to live, how much we're going to spend, alternative income sources, all this sort of thing. So it's actually an impossible question for me to uh, answer, where do I invest my money? Because uh, maybe you, you want to invest in emus or something because you love emus and uh, or whatever, so maybe that's the best place for you to invest uh, uh, your money, who, who, who knows? Anyway, the upshot of that is that as each day goes by, more... People, investors, looking to get yield, will realise, oh my God, we're not going back to 6% term deposit rates, let alone the 12% back in the early 1990s. These interest rates are going to go be low forever. Where do I get a decent return? And they will gravitate more and more towards the property sector. Us in New Zealand, people in Australia, people around the world generally. Down in New Zealand, we have large institutional fund managers from overseas, new ones, coming down to New Zealand trying to buy commercial property because they need to try and boost returns on their portfolios over in the UK, over in the US, over in Asia, you know, uh, Europe, um, etc. The world is awash with money looking for a home and looking for some better yield than the negative interest rate you can get in Japan or across in Europe now, um, for instance. And like I say, as each day goes by, more people will decide property is where it's at. Maybe it's a unitised, uh, syndicated commercial thing. Maybe it's residential. So the pool of yourselves looking to purchase something is simply going to grow over time as the realisation kicks in. These interest rates are going to be low for a long period of time. They're probably going to go down by another quarter of a percent in either April um, or, or, or June. Um, and like I say, just stay low for a long period of time. So no, I don't see an interest rate shock coming along. I've got in here as factor number six, regional investments, you see, because what happens with the property cycle is that Auckland goes gangbusters, and then you reach a point where you're saying, Auckland's a bit expensive, the yields are low, I'm now going to look at the regions. And that started for the regions generally early last year, Wellington maybe September or October last year. So I'm just going to say a little bit about the regions, partly in the context of, does this mean people stop buying in Auckland and they go and buy elsewhere? Well, a lot of people probably did that for a period of about four or five months, especially from October 1, the IRD requirements and all these, these, these sort of things. And yes, the regions, many of them are going gangbusters and will continue to do so for quite some time. And I think in particular Wellington, I've, I've got a personal thing about Wellington there, in that Wellington, in my mind, is pretty much the only other city in New Zealand that you can leave Auckland as a young, aspirational, career-focused couple and go to and not be stepping off the ladder. If you go anywhere else, everyone's going to look at you and go, oh, you're sort of stepping out of it. You're stepping out of the rat race, aren't you? Even Christchurch, I would say that. When people get uh, shifted within large corporations like the BNZ down to Christchurch, it's almost impossible to get them out again because they love the lifestyle sort of thing down there. But Wellington, it offers that very strong head office connectivity. Head offices are still there. BNZ still got about 1,500 people there, for instance. You're not really hopping out of the organisation to any massive degree at all. And the government bureaucracy is down there um, as well. So Wellington has a different dynamic from every other part of the country. But then Tauranga has got its dynamic ageing population, okay? Hamilton, that whole economic, you know, node agglomeration connectivity, it's got its thing going for it. But the regions generally, these comments now I'm making do not so much apply to Wellington, Hamilton, and Christchurch, uh, Tauranga, I, I don't know, Whangarei, I've got absolutely no idea about Whangarei and exactly what happens up there, so I'll just, uh, I'll, I'll leave that to yourselves, uh, uh, good luck there. This is what happens. You see the yields in Auckland are too low, the mortgage too high, 
So you start hunting around the regions. You do more than what I did online, Fokatane and Nelson, this sort of thing. You physically go out there. And you drive out there at the back of some town and you see a new subdivision going up and you see some lovely new houses being built. And it makes you feel safe about investing in that location. And it just so happens that when you are there, there is a farmer selling 20 acres of land over there. You're probably there in summer, is a key important point here, okay? And so you think, look, this place is going up. Everybody's flocking to wherever. I just saw an article on TV about a young, beautiful couple with blonde hair and a lovely, cute kid and dog, and they've shifted across there for the lifestyle and this sort of thing. Therefore, this place is going to boom. And so you buy the 20 acres and you develop it without realizing the one subdivision you saw is going to take care of population growth in that location for the next decade. In fact, maybe the next 20 years or so. And what happens is you end up with excess carving up of bits of land, and the bit of land you bought in summer, well, the farmer was very happy to sell you to that and let you walk on it, because in winter, you can't walk on it. It's actually a swamp. But in summer, it's not. So be very careful. I'm not saying don't invest in the regions, but just be very careful about your population growth assumptions. That's what people tend to get wrong when we get to the regional boom part of the property cycle. You over-extrapolate what the rate of growth in the population is likely to be for the next 10 or 20 years in Whanganui, in Invercargill. You go to Invercargill or places like that because of the yield. Oh, look, I'm getting a 15% yield or that sort of thing. Well, that's fine. But just be aware this may be a very long-term hold on the asset that you purchased down there, okay? So I'm just, it's just a wee warning. And um, the relevance of here, do I think, therefore, everyone leaves uh, Auckland and starts investing in the rest of the country, it's definitely a wave at the moment, but it's not a permanent thing. It's not like Auckland went up and now it's everybody else's turn and nobody comes back to Auckland for 20 years. Not the case um, um, at all. Factor number seven there, just finishing it off, um, ageing population. As a population gets older, you need more houses for the same quantity of people because uh, you go, the, the kids have left, they go get their own house, uh, one partner dies, one person is left and even a, you know, a, a one or two bedroom unit. Ageing population that we've got in New Zealand generally, you need more houses for the same population. Related to that, people living longer as well. People needing yield income in retirement, not for 5, 10 or 15 years, and then they cark it, but 30 years. People need something to invest in. They look for something that's going to give them a return over an extended period of time. So the question I've had for the past 20 years has been, what about when the baby boomers retire and sell their investment properties? And I've sort of said, no, I really don't think it's going to happen. Well, no, it's definitely not going to happen. They need to hold on and acquire more properties in order for the rental income that they're going to be able to produce in the so far proven record of capital gain in some locations. Maybe they sell them in 25 years' time or something like that. Uh, you know, who knows? But in the next few years, no, we're not going to see a rush of that property come on the market. And people are not going to be uh, uh, socially aware and uh, sell the four-bedroom house and move into a little one-bedroom unit because the extra bedrooms you can rent out maybe on Airbnb or for people to set up you know, some sort of webcam business or, or something like that in a, in, a, in a back bedroom. If not, do it yourself. There's people out there who like whatever involving toes and all sorts of... <laughs> charge for it, you know, put a, put a, put a, put a paywall in. Um, number eight, what have I got there? Um, Chinese buyers, obviously uh, a high lot of attention paid there to the buyers by the Chinese and Asian buyers uh, more generally. Uh, are basically a market that sort of dried up from about October 1 with the uh, um, IRD uh, number requirement. And of course, you also pulled back from buying properties um, at about that time, um, A, because the Chinese were pulling back and you thought, ah, everyone's going to pull back and some people are going to sell their houses. I'm going to wait for these other people to sell their houses and then I'll get something more cheaply. You know what everybody did or was supposed to have done when the LAQC thing was changing and the uh, depreciation rules were changing and the market didn't go down? Well, the realisation cut in possibly two months ago, certainly over the past month uh, ago in Auckland, this is not a permanent decline in the market um, at all. These buyers are, start, A, the Chinese buyers are now starting to come back in, of course, because they're getting the IRD numbers in order. There is a thing coming along at some stage, QDII, what does that say? Qualified Domestic Individual Investor 2 in China, six cities where people are going to be able to take half their wealth overseas. It's not in place yet, but that's an increase in Chinese demand for the world as a whole that's going to come along um, at some, some stage. But as I say, there's a reappearance that has anecdotally been put to me uh, over the past four weeks of the Chinese buyers back at the auctions, uh, again for your guide. And what's that last thing I wrote there? Oh yeah, final factor there, backlog. Some people didn't buy houses in 2007 because interest rates were too high. And then they didn't buy them in 2008 because they thought the world was going into a Great Depression and that sort of carried through into 2009. 
And that carried through into 2010 and 2011 in terms of they thought banks weren't lending on home security any longer. They're poor young people. They've never had a mortgage before, so they hopped themselves out of the market. And the other factor um, at the time, well, Auckland prices were rising you know, reasonably rapidly and people were saying, oh, no, 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 I'm not going to buy now because the prices are going to fall. We're still going to get this 40% decline in, in price. And whenever anybody asks me from, I'll claim the middle of 09, I will not claim the first half of 2009 when there was still a dog's breakfast out there, but whenever anybody's asked me since the middle of 09, should I buy a house in Auckland now or wait for the price to go down? My response has been, I think it's a pretty stupid idea waiting, I would buy now, and it is still the same comment. My, what I'm trying to say here is that as each year goes, has gone by, there have been people who have decided, said, I'm going to wait a bit and see what happens. And there is a massive backlog of frustrated buyers out there acting as a strong supporting factor in the market. So anything comes along, makes the market go down, they're going to be looking to step in and finally make their purchase. As each year goes by, more people get towards a 30% deposit or 20% deposit, um, et cetera. Get rid of the student loan, start building up some savings, that sort of thing. So that backlog of frustrated buyers and the shortage of property. All of these factors I've run through, basically from a simple economics 101 point of view, say that this was just a temporary pause in the Auckland market there when prices fell about 5% on average, you know, looking at the, the sale prices, and then they rose by the REINZ number by 5.5% in February. In fact, when you look at the days taken to sell a property on average, uh, compared with the average. So here's the number of days in a month it usually takes to sell a property in Auckland. And if you look up until September last year, faster than average. So if the average for August was like 30 days, you might, you, the properties were selling on average 25 days or something like that. September was 3.5 days faster than average. And then over December, sorry, October, November, December, January, it was sort of level there. So yeah, things slowed down. And then in February, 3.7 days faster than average. So that's why I sort of took myself back to maybe two months ago. People started to come back into the market and hoover up some of the stock out there. It was a temporary pause. The upshot of all the factors I've got there, and probably a few I haven't sort of got around to mentioning that you, you might be aware of um, as well, is that from an economics 101 macro point of view that I come from, don't ask me about should you buy in Sandringham or Three Kings or something like that. I don't even know where these suburbs are, okay? I know CBD, I know Christchurch pretty well, I know Wellington pretty well, but you've you got places up here I probably can't even pronounce um, as well. So don't ask me about the suburbs. But from my point of view, my expertise as a macroeconomist in the big picture. The big picture says to me that as long as your, your volcano there doesn't go up, or an asteroid hits, or we get foot and mouth, or the Reserve Bank goes, ah, oh, sod this, and just whacks in a 70% minimum deposit requirement on you, uh, don't rule it out in case things really start going ballistic, um, then I see basically you know, capital gains coming back, uh, get back again. I've got no idea what the magnitude will be. I don't think any sane person forecast prices would rise 90% between 2009 and sort of late last year, or even that the price gain would you know, hit 25% pace last year. That is the thing you do not want to see happening. Because the Reserve Bank, it cannot raise interest rates to slow down the housing market. This is a problem around the world. Reserve banks would love to raise rates to slow down their housing markets, but it will screw their economies. It won't help achieve their inflation outcomes. Hence, central banks are moving more towards um, capping maximum borrowing uh, versus income in Ireland and the UK, uh, for instance. Or it's you know, minimum 30% deposit requirement. If the regions go ballistic, your 30% deposit requirement will be put out in the regions. If Auckland goes ballistic, simplest thing the Reserve Bank to do, go to 50% deposit requirement. If it stays ballistic, 75%. That's the new tool they would be looking at because they can't use the interest rates any longer. Now, on that note of a just be careful out there, don't flip the bird to the Reserve Bank too much because they used to take your interest rates to 11%. They can't do that, but they have other tools that they can use. So just on that wee warning, I'll open it all up for questions and, uh, and comments there just for the next maybe five minutes before having a wee break and passing on to, uh, to Matthew there. So, any questions? And I will repeat the question, although I think microphone may go across uh, to gentleman there, I believe. I will also repeat the question. <clears throat> yeah, hi, Tony. What's your view on the global economic situation? So, you know, domestic US is, is doing okay, but all their international companies have been suffering, not making earnings projections. Europe's low, China's risky. That could impact tourism, dairy stays down. What do you see going forward, going forward with that kind of risk scenario? 
Okay, since the, uh, the question is about what's, what's the world economic outlook, basically China, US, Europe, you know, UK, this, this sort of thing. World growth, uh, well, one of the measures, average is about 3.5% a year. We're looking at maybe 3% this year, forecast to be slightly faster next year. That forecast has come down from early this year, OECD, IMF or whatever. So world growth outlook has deteriorated since early this year. That has led to extra cutting interest rates in Japan, in Europe, and expectations of US monetary policy tightening, which when they raised their cash rate for the first time since 2006 in December, the expectation was they'll go four more times this year. Now, wobbly world, maybe they'll only go one more time this year. So that's sometimes what I talk about in, in my other talks. Um, US is looking okay, just a bit of a pull back recently in retail spending and consumer spending. General view is still growing two, maybe two and a half percent if you're lucky in the US. Europe is still growing okay. The expectation this year is about 1.7% growth. It's not strong, but I have deep worries about Europe. It's either going to be the Brexit, I assign an increasing probability to the UK leaving uh, the European Union, and no one's got the foggiest idea exactly what that is going to do, but Europe has been pressured by that, by the migration crisis, by President Putin expanding sort of Russia on the other side there. And the key problem for Europe is that they've tried to stimulate growth by you know, easing monetary policy, by government spending. These things cannot drive growth. All they can do is buy time for your private sector to get more efficient and pop out the other side. And they won't restructure their economies enough. New Zealand, Australia, radical restructuring in the 1980s. So the world looks at us as highly deregulated, sort of efficient economies. They have proven in Japan they can't deregulate their economy. They've proven again in France they can't deregulate their labour market enough uh, uh, at the moment. So I've got some deep concerns about Europe over the longer term. Japan, minimal growth is likely in the near future. Rapidly ageing and shrinking population. The population of Japan is currently about 128 million. In the next 50 years, it goes down to about 88 million uh, uh, people. So it's obviously a huge constraint on growth. Australia's doing okay. Australia's undertaken a really good transition from economy being driven by mineral sector development, energy sector development, towards services sector growth and the tourism um, as well. On the tourism side, even from these sort of slightly wobbly parts of the world, we've got a big increase in the number of visitors coming down to New Zealand. They must really like hairy feet and holes in the ground or whatever it is. But we've got a big increase in the numbers, not only coming from, from China, sort of 40, 60% increase in the past year, but also from North America and also from Europe a, as well. Maybe it's good marketing by Air New Zealand, Tourism New Zealand or, or whatever. I think it would take an a, a, a new global financial crisis. I think that's what it would take for the tourism sector to become munted. Um, it's possible, not highly probable, but that is one possible scenario out there. And that probably comes more out of China, where huge debts have been built up over the past few years, and there are worries that maybe some of the regional governments, individual companies, state-owned enterprises may not be able to repay, may not be able to service their debts. It's not going to implode because the central government will simply bail them out one way or another. They cannot allow the economy to fail. It will not fail in China. It's simply a matter of how much extra spending do they undertake on infrastructure, loosen bank lending rules, cut interest rates, etc. And just quickly, finally on the sort of world growth outlook thing, the big picture for China is growth for three and a half decades has been driven by exports, infrastructure spending and you know, fixed asset investment, putting in place big apartment buildings, etc., in manufacturing, growth will be driven like a normal modern economy, the services sector, technology developments, and household spending in particular. But China's stuck in this middle period. When these are easing off, these aren't rising rapidly enough. And nobody knows how low they go and how long this period is going to be. That's the source of the key concern about China. Don't worry about the share market, massively overvalued, limited linkage with the economy. Only 2% of Shanghai shares are owned overseas, so there's not a huge relevance of that for the rest of the economy. But that's the big picture for China. Um, eventually driven over here, but for the moment they're in just a bit of a, a massively uncertain period. But the slowdown in growth will, I think, be contained by the, uh, by the supreme leaders, uh, essentially. <laughs> Thank you. Can I? Thank you, Tony. I'll kick you off now. Okay, I'm, I'm out of here. Hey, look, thanks everybody for uh, sticking around for this session. Like I say, website, tonyalexander.co.nz. I'm not saying go and click on it because I make money. It's a filing cabinet. You'll look at it and go, that's embarrassing.
It's such a basic website. It's just basically when I write something, I basically vomit it onto the website there, and you can go and click on the PDF and, and go for your life and sign up if you like for my weekly overview, where I talk about pretty much whatever interests me, usually on a Friday or, or a, mon a Monday, which recently was, why didn't we pass on all of the cash rate decrease? It's costing us more to borrow money overseas, is the politically correct answer, basically, um, and, and the dairy sector. And I usually always write something about the housing market, and I did a wee summary of stuff in Auckland in the one I released last Thursday night. So you're welcome to basically dip in there. Otherwise, um, each fortnight in the property press, I also write an article on housing, interest rates are more generally there as well. So on that note, look, thanks everybody for sticking around for this session and enjoy the rest of the evening. Thanks very much. Thank you.